Welcome to Stars and Swords. I'm Alistair Stevens. This week, in what will probably be the shortest reading that we will ever do on this podcast, a mere 28 pages in the paperback edition covering the last three chapters of Terry Miles's Rabbits. So buckle up as Kay is transported to the tower, meets familiar enemies and unfamiliar friends, remembers a lot, but not all, of what has been forgotten, and wins the game to save the world. I mentioned back at the beginning of this series that by far the most frequent criticism of Terry Miles' podcast work is that these stories do not have satisfying endings, that oftentimes they don't have endings at all. And let's put our cards on the table right now. A lot of readers don't like the end of this book. I don't want to build a straw man here or misrepresent the many varied perspectives that you will see online, but I think it's fair to say that the unfavorable critical response to the end of this book is focused on a combination of unclear action, of dubious cause and effect, of certainly an excess of exposition, and a dissatisfyingly anticlimactic move in terms of the underlying mysteries of the game. And in all of this, through all of this, K is mostly a passive observer, a witness to events. And I don't think that those critical responses are in any way invalid. The end of this book is, I admit, difficult. In fact, Let's take that a step further and say that the end of this book is not very good, at least as we experience it in the moment on the page. But I think that the weakness in the moment-to-moment storytelling here is an active impediment to our understanding of a really ambitious and interesting conclusion, which not only reframes a lot of our understanding of Kay's backstory, but opens some fascinating speculative opportunities about the nature of the game itself, about the nature of this fictional world. So this week, no preamble. Let's get straight into our reading. We open chapter 42 in the elevator, in the tower, and emerge once more into the lobby of the penthouse space, which is now, we note, staffed. We get the description of the books on the coffee table, including the Malacetic Atlas, which is a reference to a guidebook of the strange and unusual mentioned oftentimes in the podcasts. We also have the photograph of the willow tree on the shore of the lake, conspicuously hung upside down, which will remind us, of course, of the invisible city of Valdrada from the Italo Calvino book we discussed last week. Here we are in this version of the city, mirrored in the lake. Here we are in the image. Emily Connors appears and hustles Kay back into the elevator, and we get one of the most curious moments in this entire reading— One of the moments, I think, that will really frame whether we appreciate or dismiss, whether we are at least inclined to appreciate or dismiss the end of this book. Quote, Hang on to this. She removed something from the back of her skirt and handed it to me. It was a small silver handgun. I didn't know anything about guns, but it looked like a model that James Bond would carry. A gun? What the fuck, Emily? Please shut up. She leaned down, opened a hidden panel on the floor of the elevator, and pressed a button. Then she stood up, grabbed her gun, and slipped it behind her, back into the waistband of her jeans like some kind of action movie heroine. The elevator started moving down. End quote. Did you spot it? Did you see it? Emily pulls the small silver gun from the back of her skirt, then a moment later tucks her own gun into the back of her jeans. Now, this could be a mistake. This could be an oversight. This could be an edit that somehow escaped the notice of everyone involved in the production of this novel. It is, we should note, present in both the print and the audio editions. And it's not the only odd contradiction that we get in these chapters. So I am inclined to read this as a consequence of these dimensional tremors, of the radiance falling apart, of the probabilities and possibilities of the worlds tangling together. And if that's true then it's also a demonstration of Kay's further regression from protagonism into a kind of selective spectator role, which is both frustrating in the moment and a direct contrast to the actual climax of the book when Kay is once again re-centered. Whether you read this as a mistake, whether you read this as carelessness, or whether you read this as subtlety, whether you read this as an indication that the world is not all that it seems, will dictate, will influence at least, how you respond to the end of this book. And as will become clear as we move through today's lecture, I cannot give you firm assurance that this was intentional. But the speculation hangs together in such a cohesive and compelling way that for me at least, I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt. Though I wouldn't blame anyone who didn't. 
Emily leads Kay into Crow's living quarters, and the two face off. Emily tells Crow that he won't be able to bring back his wife and daughter, and he says that the system, rather than falling apart, is about to reset. Rather than destroy the multiverse, it will be, in some sense, healed. Crow's guards are about to kill Emily and Kay, but are then themselves shot by the twins who suddenly show up with Swan. They do a second version of this same confrontation, and then Swan, without ceremony, kills Crow and tells Kay that the world really is ending, and we get a great line here too, quote, A universe doesn't die like a person. She looked down at Crow's body lying twisted on the ground. It's not light fading from a cage of blood and bone. It's billions of years of starfire and wonder. End quote. And at this point, we finally have enough information, direct and indirect, that we can really meaningfully speculate about the nature of the game. Here, in our very short final reading, we can talk about rabbits. Crow says that Hawk Warwicker invented the game to stabilize the radiance, these naturally occurring lines of force observed first by Meacham. Crow has perverted that game and has destabilized the radiance, which are now, to quote Swan, out of alignment. The game could be used to repair the damage, if someone could win it, whatever that means, but the game is too corrupt to be used and Swan doesn't know how to fix the radiance without it, which gives us, I think, a very strong confirmation that the Wardens are connected to the game, that they are connected to rabbits, not to the radiance. That is, they are a part of the system created by Warwicker, rather than something innately supernatural. More on that in the next chapter. So here's the obvious question, and what I hope is an interesting answer. Why does Warwicker create the game? Why must the Radiance be stabilized? Crow asserts that, quote, Hulk Warwicker created his game under the auspices of stabilizing the Radiance, and by doing so he effectively neutered the mechanism that exists beneath the world, the mysterious elemental force that Meacham's Radiance manipulate, end quote. So, on the one hand, I think that's a pretty bad sentence. Neutering, in particular, doesn't seem to be an appropriate verb when one is describing a mysterious elemental force, but, you know, Crow's the bad guy, so maybe we don't need to expect the highest order rhetoric from him. We know that Crow wants the system to be destabilized in the belief that the destabilized system will reset, presumably that it will go back to how things are, quote-unquote, supposed to be, whatever that means. It's unclear why he believes there would be a reset mechanism or what that would look like. But I'm interested in this idea of stabilization and what the natural state of the Radiance is. Because if we assume that Hawk Warwicker is a good guy, or given the time and effort he spent drugging children in utero to manipulate their magical probability powers, as well as creating this dangerous, secret, addictive game, maybe not so much a good guy as a guy who at least believes he is doing right for the world. If we assume that his motives are good, if not his means, then we would recognize that stable radiants are good and unstable are bad. That certainly seems to be reflected in our understanding of what Crow is doing here at the end of the book. But if the game is intended to stabilize, then what is the counteracting force? What is destabilizing them before the inauguration of that first iteration of the game? Because Warwicker doesn't begin the game until 1959, and the Radiants, we are told, are natural and ancient, presumably as old as the world itself. This could be a product of a natural state, an entropic decline into chaos, and Warwicker just manages to catch it at the right time. And we might think here, too, of the suggestions that the game has been running for a very long time, and that Warwicker is only responsible for the modern iterations, though that, too, could be part of Rabbit's desire to self-mythologize. But when I think about Rabbit's as a system being set in opposition to a contradictory force, a destabilizing force, well, I look at the rest of the book and I think about connections. I think about these chains of inference and intuition that aren't a part of the game. Because if there's a natural tendency in the universe to present these connections, if they are naturally occurring glitches in a natural matrix, and and perhaps the following of these connections contributes to that destabilization, which is very much what Crow is doing in the penthouse of the tower, thanks to his amazing omniscient computer system, right? He is deliberately manipulating things that are not rabbits in order to destabilize the radiance. But that means that K is also contributing to that destabilization. 
It might even give us an explanation for why bad things happen after following these chains of connection, because you are experiencing actual localized instability. We might take that a step further and speculate that perhaps that gray fuzziness that Kay feels so consistently is a product of the destabilized radiant network. It is the crack that lets in the dark, in this case. So it is possible, at least, that this ongoing game of connections, as opposed to the ongoing game of rabbits, is a destabilizing force. But here's the thing. The modern world is saturated in information in a way that the pre-modern world simply wasn't. And connections relies on a density of language, of iconography, of ideography, of information that wouldn't have been available before every surface in your field of view is covered in symbols that are six meanings deep. There couldn't have been a Mandela effect in the 18th century because too little information was shared by too few people who were too geographically isolated, and what information there was would have been considered far more unreliable anyway. The information saturation of the modern world, particularly in an urban setting, creates so many more possibilities for the clash of different realities, for the linking of these improbable events, that more and more people are going to see them, follow them, each contributing to that destabilization. This, by the way, could be an explanation for why the iterations of rabbits are becoming shorter and more frequent. The destabilizing force would also be accelerating as we are all caught in this ongoing deluge of information and symbolism all hours of the day and night. This is, of course, all speculation. But it fits the information as we've been given it in the novel. Chains of connection occur naturally. Following them adjusts the radiance in a destabilizing way. Rabbits is artificial. Following it adjusts the radiance in a stabilizing way. This also, I suppose, explains the prize associated with the game. If it is this important, we need to motivate people to play beyond the mystery itself. It is, perhaps, a possible interpretation. From here, we wake in the Magician's Arcade, and, wow, this is a lot. We get a ton of fragmented exposition from Emily, which, for the sake of clarity, I am going to run through in a reassembled chronological order, rather than the much more anarchic order in which it's presented in the book. This, then, is what is happening in this novel 101. Decades ago, Hawk Warwicker discovers the Meacham Radiance and comes up with this system to interact with them, to stabilize them. This is the game. This is Rabbits. The modern iterations of the game are attested from 1959. Warwicker dies in 2010 at the age of 76, per the story by Yumiko Tanaka that we get in chapter 10. That means that he was born in 1934, and so was 25 or so when the game started. Warwicker also establishes the Gatewick Institute in the 1970s as a means of experimenting through drugs and mental training with further means of manipulating these radiants. It also seems likely that a similar program to Gatewick creates the Wardens, who are also capable of crossing dimensional streams. In fact, the Wardens significantly predate Gatewick because the first reference to the Wardens comes from the manifesto found in the laundromat in Seattle in 1959, right around the time that the first iteration of the game begins. Years later, probably the early 90s, given that Kay remembers this event happening, we have Crow, and we have Crow's daughter, Natalie. Natalie is also a Gatewick kid. She has the same kind of abilities as Emily and Kay. When she learns that a friend of hers has died, in her grief she vanishes into another dimensional stream, a consequence of that sudden emotional intensity. Over the years, Crow tries to follow her, to find her, but she is gone, apparently from all of the dimensional streams. Crow resolves to do whatever is necessary to find her, but at this point, Hawk Warwicker is still alive and in charge. You'll note here that Emily, previously, talked about Crow trying to find his wife and daughter, but there's no mention of the wife here, or indeed anywhere else in the book, and I am tempted, in my way, to speculate that perhaps Swan is Crow's wife, the avian name connection is interesting at least, and there's a poetry to her being the one to kill him, but the way that she refers to your daughter consistently rather than our daughter gives me significant pause. There's also the detail that Swan is described as being around 35 and Crow as being, quote, middle-aged or older, with a great deal of imprecision there. But as Emily tells us, not all dimensions operate in the same temporal space, so, you know, timey-wimey hand-wave stuff. 
But since there's no really compelling argument in favour of that theory, I think instead that wife and daughter becoming just daughter is in fact another example of the world changing under our feet. And honestly, there's something really powerful and compelling about even the highest level motivation of the villain shifting as a consequence of his plot. To attempt something so profound and dangerous and to have the very reason that you began this nefarious journey change, that's some good science fiction speculation right there. Not long after Natalie is lost in the deep past of the story, sometime around 1996, Emily, Annie, and Kay are all kids together in Lakewood. While Kay is visiting the Connor family vacation home, Annie goes off by herself, and sometime later, Emily and Kay find her dead at the bottom of a well. In that moment of grief and of shock, Kay pulls Emily to another dimensional strand, waking up in bed with Annie still alive. Emily knows that this happened and remembers it. She tells her parents about it, and they, concerned, tell the story to Crow, who is looking for kids with these abilities, and presumably makes a note about Emily, believing that it was she and not Kay who jumped dimensional strands. Later still, in 1999, Kay gets in the truck with Emily and Annie to go in search of the night station, and Annie dies again. Kay's memory of that event are tangled, but that at least is true. Kay suffers a concussion in the crash, which might be the reason that, despite Emily begging Kay to help, they don't dimensionally slip this time. Annie is dead for keeps. In fact, there's a strong possibility here that Kay did, in fact, use their ability, because after the crash, which Emily remembers as being caused by a tractor and Kay remembers as being caused by an elk, Kay and Emily are suddenly outside of the truck, sitting on the dirt shoulder at the side of the road. The combination of physical displacement and inconsistent memories certainly points toward a change of dimensional stream. And the possibility that Kay, in this moment of desperation, saved Emily but not Annie is haunting. After this, the Gatewick Project is shut down by Hulk Warwicker, and Kay hides from Crow by using their ability and moving to another dimensional stream. In 2002, Kay's parents die. Warwicker dies in 2010, the same year that the circle shows up in the credits of what we suspect is Terry Miles' film A Night for Dying Tigers at the Toronto International Film Festival. At that point, Crow takes over and begins to use the game to try to get his daughter back. He also hires Emily, who discovers that Crow is deliberately damaging the Radiants, forcing them out of alignment. Emily tracks down Kay for help, they fall in love, they are married, then four years ago, Kay travels to this universe, the universe in which we've spent almost all of this story, as part of a plan with Emily to prevent Crow from destroying everything. Kay's memory, unfortunately, is changed. That timeline, by the way, connects with what we're told in Chapter 10 about the beginning of the ninth iteration of the game back in 2016. Quote, during this period, I experienced severe mental lapses, panic attacks, and inexplicable losses of time. I attributed all of this to months of relentless sleep deprivation, so I made an appointment to see a therapist with experience treating acute insomnia, end quote. This is the building with the vanishing floor and Kay's breakdown. All of this, we can now infer, is a product of Kay leaving the dimensional strand in which they are married to Emily and winding up here. And obviously, as you can tell by how much work I had to put into parsing this story, the exposition in the sequence is difficult to get through. We bounce around in the timeline, and we bounce around what is sure and certain and what is speculation, confirming some and dismissing others. And it doesn't help that as we bounce around, we clearly have a checklist of outstanding questions that the book feels it needs to address before we can move into the last movement of the story. For all that, this is heady stuff, and I find myself enjoying it. I particularly find the image of the black well to be affecting, to be heartbreaking, to picture Kay and Emily coming across the broken body of Annie and then immediately transiting into that different dimensional stream where Annie is once more alive, that's powerful stuff. From there, Kay makes the decision to try to save the world, as they ought, and we go out in search of Emily's car, dodging Detective Sanders, who informs Kay that Murmur 2 has gone missing. The game, as the Radiance destabilize, is claiming more and more people. The game is becoming more and more dangerous. As we begin Chapter 44, we might be reminded of our discussion last week about both 90s Gen X culture and Kay's default level of minor contempt for mainstream society. Quote, as we moved through the night, the chaos of the city gave way to the peaceful quiet of the suburbs, 
and I imagined the people who lived there feeling safe and warm behind their perfect lawns and creatively shaped mailboxes. They'd be getting ready for bed, reading stories to their kids while half thinking about something else, signing forms for field trips, putting off sex to finish binging a show on HBO, and all the while, just outside their doors, the entire multiverse was most likely coming to an end. End quote. And the combination here of the slightly contemptuous tone directed towards suburban ignorance and the thrilling tension of living a secret life in a secret world alongside the real, these are classic elements of urban fantasy, that special privilege of knowing what lies beneath the surface of the everyday world, that understanding that is both dangerous and cool. From there, they drive out to Lakewood, back to the site of Annie's lasting death, and they take the road toward the Petermans' house once again, consciously recreating the events of that night in 1999. And in the moment of climax, Kay finds themselves again in the darkness between worlds, that same darkness that their mother taught them to navigate by summoning emotional intensity and then simply making a choice. And here, we really hit the philosophical heart of the book. Because in this moment, Kay both makes a choice and is surprised, and the significance of both of those things will resonate through and, I believe, will transform the last chapter of this book. Kay moves toward the light here in this suspended dark space, and we get the quick montage flashes of alternate worlds. Kay's mother in a strange house filled with their belongings, suggesting that they had never been involved with Gatewick, perhaps, running through a field and jumping over the Black Well, perhaps having switched places with Annie, alone in the Harvard Exit Theatre, laughing with her father as an old man, then back in the car in search of the night station, and then this, quote, the left side of my body began to tingle as the light came closer, but just as it was about to reach me, I felt somebody grab my other hand and pull. I turned my head to see who it was. That's when the light hit me and the world exploded in a blinding flash. I was stretched thin and twisted, all emptiness and cold. So, first, here's my interpretation of what has happened here. In the space between worlds, Kay can feel the various dimensional strands and is choosing the strand containing, or the strand embodied in the distant smudge of light. In that process, Kay passes through these other alternate worlds, getting flashes of sense from each in turn, but at the last moment, someone grabs her other hand, not the hand still holding Emily's, grabs her other hand and pulls, and Kay drops into the smudge of light world, where the car is racing toward the shadow creature on the road. This is the same world, presumably, that Kay remembers after the original night station crash, where we got the first description of this shadow creature, and then, quote, I opened my mouth to scream and suddenly I was a black hole and I was pulling everything that existed into me. There was a screaming from the burning heart of the world and everything exploded in a brilliant blaze of liquid fire and darkness. And then there was nothing. End quote. This I take to be Kay taking this universe, this dimensional stream, to another place. We know that Kay can carry people with her, like carrying Emily after finding Annie in the Black Well, so this moment is Kay taking everyone to the dimension of Kay's choosing, a dimension where the game is won, where the radiants are restored, where the world is saved. And it's important to remember, very important to remember, that the world that's described to us in the final chapter is the world that Kay has chosen. This isn't where we've been before. This is the world where Kay has won the game. Before we get to that, though, an interesting question. Who took Kay's hand? There's an obvious structural symmetry to this, I think. Emily is holding Kay's right hand, so we can maybe speculate that it's Chloe who takes the left, the two women who love Kay, giving Kay strength and guidance in this moment, and that might be true, it's certainly compelling. But to me, in this moment where Kay is summoning all of their feelings and making their choice, Following the advice on how to navigate the dimensional space given by their mother, this from chapter 39, quote, My mother told me that the best way to deal with the situation was to follow my instincts and make a choice. First, she said, I needed to bring all of the emotion I could to the surface. Think about the love I felt for my family. Think about being strong and centered. And then she told me to concentrate as hard as I could on the currents and focus on finding the best path, the one that felt right. And once I'd done that, all I had to do was reach down into that specific current grab her hand, and she'd be there to help me wake up. End quote. So this, to me, is the potential of the interdimensional space. 
These are the worlds in which Kay's mother is still alive, as we saw in one of the flashes, worlds in which her father too is still alive. And this, to me, is Kay's mother making good on the promise she made when Kay was small. Reach out, and I'll take your hand. And in a broader sense, Emily tells us in The House by the Lake after the rocket sequence that the soul exists beyond the individual dimensional stream, that in a sense, all versions of Kay are connected to the soul of Kay, all versions of Kay's mother are in some sense this Kay's mother. This idea perhaps is seeded by the glimpse that we get of Kay spending time with her mother and with her elderly father in an alternate stream. This high-level conceit, by the way, that some people die in a single dimension or timeline while others vanish from every dimension is never explored, and I don't really know what to make of it. I want to study it and explore the rules. I want to try and determine how this system works, but I can't find a consistency. Annie didn't die in every world, nor did Kay's parents, I guess, because we can see them in these flashing montages. We saw the magician die, but that could have been misdirection, or perhaps he was drawn from another dimensional stream here at the end of the novel too, but Baron and Neil are both still dead. We might speculate about there being a difference between a true canonical death, this is how your story is supposed to end, and death by mistake or misadventure, but we just don't have enough information. But for me, one of the most touching and elegant parts of this finale is the moment where the figure takes Kay's hand, the figure that I take to be Kay's mother, takes their hand. From there, we move into the epilogue. Kay wakes in the Peterman's house, which has been rented by Alan Scarpio following instructions he received on a postcard six months ago. You'll note that postcard features the same lakeside willow that we saw in the tower, perhaps implying that Kay has emerged from the lake and is back in the real Valdrada. Scarpio, we're told, found Kay by the side of the road, but no Emily. In fact, Scarpio, who also knows Emily, says that she has disappeared. And here's our challenge for the rest of this chapter. We must be skeptical of Scarpio. He shows up here to offer explanations for what has happened, but he begins by saying this, quote, over the next little while, you're probably going to notice a number of discrepancies between what you remember about the game and what others experienced while you were playing. I'd suggest saying as little as possible to anyone until you have a firm grasp of their understanding of events, but that's up to you. End quote. If our interpretation is correct, of course, then this is a new dimensional strand, which means that Scarpio's memories of what has happened are potentially no more reliable than Kay's, potentially, in fact, much less reliable. And to take a half step back here, it is a bold choice for the book to bring in the authority figure established at the beginning of the story to try to put a neat bow on everything, to try to close down that possibility space and to give the story some closure. And I absolutely understand why some readers take Scarpio to be here the hand of the author, the final exposition. And many readers will feel some friction from that, but I think that there's a level of irony at work here. The big picture is this. Scarpio argues that Rabbits is the product of this incredible advanced artificial intelligence created in 1959 by Hawk Warwicker based on the Radiance. Is it possible that this AI can hire people to change the Fremont Troll, to reopen the Kingfisher Cafe, to scrub references to Richard Linklater's Before Midnight from Kay's search results, to make a new David Bowie album? Has Kay just suffered, as Scarpio implies, exhaustion and mental breakdown? And the answer, of course, is no. Because... And we should be sensitive here to the emergence of a possible theme in the book, because Kay doesn't just interact with the objective details of the world around them, no matter how important those objective details are in both the framing and the text of this novel. Kay interacted with people, and it's those people which ground the story. Chloe has observed the contradictions, as well as Baron and the magician and Neil and so many others, and this is an object lesson, I guess, in how to interpret texts, particularly the end of texts, because the close reading part of my critical response wants to just nitpick. How would an AI operating in the real world convince Chloe to play along with the fantasy that David Bowie hadn't died in 2016, unless we're supposed to believe that Chloe, and literally everyone else connected to Kay, is a paid actor, manipulated by this all-powerful AI to create these contradictions and connections that make up rabbits that K is in effect the only real person and everyone else is a part of this practical, physical simulation. Do we really buy this explanation about the Fremont troll that some Seattle contractor got a weird call in the middle of the night to go and change this iconic piece of street art and then change it back? Literally? 
No. And it's tempting to get caught up in these questions, to nitpick, to try to find our way out of this conflict by following a breadcrumb trail of details, and I do think that we could, to be clear. But there's another approach that we should take. Because if we pause for a moment and consider the tone of this piece, this vision of a world under the heel of an authoritarian AI, even a benevolent one, this clearly isn't the emotional thrust of the story. We're supposed to be feeling good about people, about love and friendship and romance and shared interests and breakfast foods. This isn't a grim, the camera pans up to an ominous horizon and we glimpse the silhouette of Skynet kind of ending. It's an ending that anchors us not in the objective minutiae of our world, not in cause and effect, not in connection, but in each other, in people. Furthermore, I think that the text highlights this discrepancy by having Scarpio highlight the philosophical problems created by his explanation surrounding the notion of free will, right? Specifically the free will of Mordecai Kubler, the writer of the Horns of Terzos novel, being compelled to write a novel in the 1970s so that the book would exist when Kay needed it most. This nod toward the paradox of free will would be significant on its own, but it's compounded by the emphasis that is put on Kay making a choice in the climax. The thing which saves the day, the thing which saves the world, the thing which wins the game, in effect, is that choice. Kay's instructions from their mother, first presented as a guide and then as a means of actual resolution to this crisis, are clear. Human choice, human connection together will save the day. Make a choice and reach for my hand. This is antithetical to the explanatory turn that we get from Scarpio here at the end of the book. All of which is to say that I don't believe Scarpio, and I don't think that the book wants me to believe Scarpio, though I do admit that it is very easy to fall into that trap. And I'll add a footnote here with a bit of wild speculation. Are we ready? There's a long-standing contradiction in some religious traditions about free will, about the paradox of free will, that God gives us free will but also knows everything that will happen, that everything is preordained, so actually we don't have free will, but we do, but we don't, and so on forever. It's the 6th century Roman philosopher Boethius who offers us a resolution to this paradox in his remarkable book on the consolation of philosophy, namely that we exist in linear time with one moment leading on to the next, but God doesn't. God apprehends all time as happening at once, simultaneously, so he can see the cause and effect happening at the same time and can order our combined free will, which is in the moment free, into a harmonious and intentional system. And it's a powerful idea. It's an idea that might also apply to this book, to rabbits, offering a resolution for this free will paradox, particularly because Emily says that the different dimensions occupy different temporal spaces. If the AI is running on a quantum system that exists in multiple dimensional strands, or in every dimensional strand, then it might similarly be able to understand time as something that is happening all at once. Again, if you are into the AI hypothesis here, that's a powerful argument in its favor. I still don't think it's really the case. It is an interesting idea, and I will jump at the opportunity to talk about Boethius. Kay's phone, we are told, now contains a photo of the floor of the stock exchange in Tokyo, where the ticker display is a new version of the circle, including the winner of the 11th iteration, Kay. Chloe shows up, confirming that from her perspective it was Kay who disappeared in the Starbucks, that the magician is alive, that what was shown on the Super 8 film didn't happen at all, or did happen and was undone. Baron Corduroy and Neil, however, are still dead, confirming that we don't know the rules for death in this universe. And then some spam from War Games appears. We learn that the new game from Sidney Farrow was called The Door is Open. The new iteration of the game may be coming soon, which presumably means that Rabbits is working properly and that the Meacham Radiants are stable. And that's it. Except, what does it mean? As I said, Scarpio's accounts of Rabbits, that this is an immensely powerful AI created in the 1950s that has been manipulating the actual physical world around K without leaving a trace, well, this doesn't work for me, and doesn't match our experience of moving through the book. It's also a fairly common resolutive maneuver in this kind of story. No, no, the supernatural elements you thought you experienced were actually entirely mundane. It was old man Carruthers who was dressed as a ghost in the old abandoned amusement park. Jinkies. Hawk Warwicker wants to stabilize the Radiance, and builds an AI to figure out how the Radiance can be stabilized, and how to manipulate the world to guide the players in order to 
enact those stabilizing moves. Well, okay, but that leaves us with a number of questions. Why, then, is the game dangerous? Why do players die? Why do we need wardens? None of these elements, remember, are introduced with the destabilization of the game prior to the 11th iteration, but are encoded in the manifesto written, we might speculate, by Warwicker himself. And as I said earlier, even if this is true of rabbits, it doesn't explain the fantastic implausibility of the connections games, which are not rabbits. Even if the AI story is true, even if there is an architect, a Moriarty, behind this vision of the game, we're still presented with a world in which there are strings of connections which can guide players to very dangerous places. A final nail in the coffin, too. We get this striking beat, Scarpio's penultimate beat in the entire story, in fact, right before Chloe shows up. Quote, Do you know a man named Crow? Not that I can recall, no. So you never went to visit him in the tower at War Games? I thought I saw a brief flash of recognition move across Scarpio's face when I mentioned Crow and the tower, but before I could press him further, there was a loud knock at the door. I jumped. Come in, Scarpio yelled. End quote. I mean, this is lampshading the fact that something isn't right here about Scarpio. You might also note that right before this beat, he tells Kay that the game knows her heart's desire. Quote, chances are you already have it or it's on the way. End quote. Then Chloe shows up and reveals that she came here after a phone call from Scarpio. So is Chloe part of what Kay wanted? Is Chloe here because of rabbits? Is Scarpio again being manipulated by the game just as he was or claims he was when he pulled Kay into the game in the first place all the way back at the beginning of the book? If Scarpio is in service to the game in an ongoing capacity, perhaps as a winner of a former iteration, then ought we to compare him to Swan, who wasn't exactly forthcoming about her allegiance and purpose? Is Swan as we infer when she shows up at the beginning of the book, actually working with Scarpio in the end? Is Scarpio a warden? Was that part of his heart's desire after winning the game? Is the job of the wardens, now that the game is over, to try to normalize what happened and disincentivize any further attempts to manipulate the world? Here's your money, go have a great life, don't think about rabbits? There are so many unresolved questions, I know. A note, too, here for the readers who are invested in Emily's story and are frustrated that she disappears from the book entirely during the climax. I will say without spoilers that Emily's story is picked up in the sequel to this novel, The Quiet Room, which, again, I can't wholeheartedly recommend that book because it's only half of its story, but I will note that it takes a really interesting premise and drops almost all of the K-style narrative that's present in this book. It's a much more conventional read, so if you like these kinds of ideas, but don't love this book, then The Quiet Game might be for you. And that's it. That's the end of the book. Kay and Chloe are together, ready to live their lives, and, I guess, keep playing the game. And in conclusion, well, if I'm correct in my understanding and my interpretation of the plot of this book, particularly in these last three chapters, I really love a lot of this ending. I love Kay's tangled past. I love the tragedy of her relationship with Emily, both in terms of Annie's death and the romance, the marriage that has been forgotten. I love Kay's agency in that closing moment, taking the road to the Peterman's house as a shortcut to the terminal radiant, using that power to move into the space between dimensions and then choosing the one that saves the day and pulling everyone with them, no less. I love the inversion of win the game, save the world, that in a sense it is saving the world that leads to Kay winning the game. I love the implied presence of Kay's mother in particular. I love Scarpio's half-hearted explanation of everything that happened at the end, honestly, and I even love that Kay ends up with Chloe. And I'll say this too, I specifically love the emotional experience of reading the end of this book. There's enough happening here that I am hooked by the details and I get a satisfying conclusion. It's only later that I look back at it and wonder what the hell happened, but I acknowledge that I am very fortunate that the magic trick of this book works so well for me. As I mentioned in a previous episode, I am the lucky inhabitant of a very small slice of a very complicated Venn diagram, and ultimately, we must acknowledge that the book stumbles in the dismount. The exposition is simultaneously pretty heavy-handed, but also weirdly obtuse, and if you get pushed out by the confrontation with Crow, or the Emily's position in the arcade, or if, like some readers, you simply drop out when Chloe disappears, then you aren't going to be primed to take in what I think is a genuinely special ending. Its ambition and emotional sensitivity and complexity are thwarted by itself. And maybe there's an argument to be made that any book that requires 30 minutes of a podcast, 40 minutes of a podcast to break down and explain its contents, maybe fails in its first and most important job, telling the story to the reader. 
And that is the fault of the book. It's the fault of a writer who has excellent ideas, but too little discipline. It's not that the book is too complicated or that books should give us simple endings tied in a bow. The problem here is that the storytelling gets in its own way, that the conduit from the mind of the author to the mind of the reader is clogged and kinked and uncertain. The author and the reader ought to meet each other halfway. This ending, and to some extent the whole book, is a valiant effort, but ultimately requires too much of the reader to really achieve its goals. As I said, it works for me, but I know I'm in a very specific place. I will, however, defend the book's formal ambition and applaud the way that it plays with the notion of what a novel can be, how it crosses over with the ludic space, with being a game. That's still a really rich and exciting area, and if Rabbits is not completely successful, I still hope it will be taken up by the academic community as an interesting experiment in the form. It will continue, I think, to point to better and brighter things. Let's wrap up with a question that I received from a listener a few weeks ago and had to postpone because, well, it's kind of dependent on the end of the book. Trav sent me a message on Instagram and asked, quote, When Kay goes on her binge after college and ends up being charged with trespass, who is the passenger she's waiting for? And quote. Okay, I think that there are three possible answers to this question, and I will present them in the order of decreasing likelihood but increasing awesomeness, okay? This, you'll recall, is after the sequence where we're first introduced to Kay playing Connections as a child and then playing the game for three days after sinking into compulsive gaming— and ending up in the basement of the theater. Explanation one. The sequence begins with the impossible photograph of the passenger pigeon, and the passenger pigeon is used in the Rabbits podcast too, so this is a familiar bit of iconography. This is a Rabbits Easter egg, if you will, that connects through the Antonioni movie and is simply echoed at the end of the scene. That is, the passenger that Kay is waiting for is simply the next passenger clue, the next thing in this chain of connections that says passenger on it. The second explanation only becomes clear here at the very end of the book, which is why I've held Trav's question until this episode, because when we examine Kay's memories of the night drive with Emily and Annie, it turns out that it is Kay and not Emily who is driving. When Kay sees the photograph of the passenger pigeon, it textually reminds them of the imperial woodpecker, which prompts the overheard discussion between Emily and Annie about rabbits, which leads directly to the night station drive. Is the passenger then Emily? Annie? Is Kay remembering some fragment of something terrible and going in search of Emily? Though this, we should note, takes place before Emily tracks Kay down, before they fall in love, before they get married, before they are separated. So it's not the grand romantic gesture that it could be interpreted as later in Kay's timeline, but it is at least potentially connected to one of the pivotal moments of Kay's life and a fragmentary memory of a dimension Kay left in order to hide from Crow. The third explanation... This one's a bit more of a swing. Kay plays connections, tracking clue to clue across the city, only to wind up in the theater waiting for someone, not searching for more clues, not drawing another connection, but apparently at the end of their journey. In a sense, this is a successful game of connections. It's complete. At least, Kay has reached the end of the line. So we might infer that either the passenger is a product of the end of the game, or that the absence of the passenger is preventing the game from continuing, is preventing the next clue from being apparent. Something is missing. Something isn't present that must be present in order for Kay to finally, definitively succeed. And we just saw Kay succeed. So what is different between these two encounters? What is different between these two experiences? Us. This is what I wonder. Are we the passenger? Is the reader of this novel sitting alongside Kay but unable to take control, along for the ride through the rest of this plot, but restricted to the present of the story, disconnected from Kay in flashback? Is the reader of this novel the passenger that Kay is waiting for? It's an interesting and rich thought. The hairs on the back of my neck, I must admit, are standing up. Though, yeah, I'm not sure that I could really go to bat for this one factually but it's a secret pet theory of mine from here on out, I think. Thank you, Trav, so much for your question, and thank you for your patience. And with all that said, that's the end of Rabbits. Let's wrap this up. Two quick notes about our schedule for the future. First, the bonus episodes for Rabbits 
are going to be delayed by a week or so because my recording schedule is absolutely full to the brim. That means that I'm planning on releasing a bonus episode looking at the first season of the Rabbits podcast somewhere around the 15th of February. And the bonus episode on the 1992 movie Sneakers will be the week after that. Both of those episodes will be recorded live over on the Next Word Discord. So if you would like to listen in live and chat with the amazing Next Word community and ask questions as I'm going, then hit patreon.com slash next word. Those shows are going to be really fun. More importantly, though, next week on Stars and Swords, we're going to begin The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab with part one of the novel. And I've got to tell you, as much as I've enjoyed talking rabbits, I'm really looking forward to getting back to a less speculative, closer to the text kind of discussion. So that episode on part one will be next Sunday, February the 11th, and I'll run through to March 16th. That's six weeks in total, one per part, with parts six and seven of the book combined into one last episode of this podcast. Also next week, I'm going to post the poll for the book we will cover in session four, after we're done with Addie LaRue, and I'm thinking about looking at some post-Tolkien fantasy with a particular focus on world building. I'm thinking about those sprawling series starting in the 70s and the early 80s, a Terry Brooks or an Anne McCaffrey or a Raymond E. Feist or a Julian May's saga of the Pleistocene exile would be fascinating, really fascinating, actually. Or maybe even something a little more modern, maybe Robert Jordan, maybe even the first George R.R. Martin novel. I don't want to go into the 21st century in this session because... I think that there's a distinct transition point somewhere around 2000 to 2001, which takes Sanderson and Rothfuss and their peers off the table. We will definitely get to them in a later session. But this time, if you have any thoughts on first books in fantasy series with interesting world building from, let's say, 1970 to 1999, then get in touch and let me know. I will put together a short list this week and you guys can vote after the next episode. I also got an email from Aaron asking what kinds of books we would cover in the future on Stars and Swords, and I wanted to clarify that the net that we are casting is as wide as it can possibly be. I have a vague plan to cover a Jane Austen novel this summer, Austen August, anyone? And then definitely do something horror-related in October, obviously, and the second Narnia book next Christmas would be a good fit, but apart from those... Something properly and and formally gothic would be fun. A hard science fiction novel would be interesting. Maybe something classic, maybe a a Clark, a Rendezvous with Rama or an Asimov or something like that. I'm open to the idea of covering a graphic novel, of dipping into some literature from other parts of the world in other traditions. Maybe even, as I suggested at the beginning of the Rabbit series, taking a brief look at nonfiction books on critical or literary theory just for a change of pace, just to give us some extra vocabulary. But that might be a bonus series, maybe over on the Patreon, because I know that despite my proclivities, reading literary theory is maybe not for everyone. In any case, if you've read something interesting that you would like to discuss, then get in touch either with me here directly at starsandswordspod at gmail.com using the contact form on the website, which isn't there yet, but will be there soon, or by stopping by the Discord via patreon.com slash nextword. That is going to do it. Thank you to Aaron for that question, by the way, and thank you to you all for listening to the Rabbits series. As I hope you can tell, I have had an absolute blast talking so much about this novel, a complicated, contradictory work, which I know forced a few of you out as we were making this journey, but still fun, I think, nonetheless. I hope that we will have as much fun and perhaps even more discussion when it comes to The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue beginning next week. Until then, as always, what do you think? Chloe asked as she grabbed my hand and pulled me up. Win the game, save the world. She laughed, and the two of us went back into the kitchen to eat French toast. Thanks for listening.